here and going forward to build the party. Am I right? That's right. Guy's so that's got, enough to do, right? The guy's got three <laughs> jobs and looking for a fourth. Sounds like an immigrant to me, but that's, a whole, <laughs> that's, that's, that's the best that's, line of the year, Kojo. <laughs> Only Kojo could have said that. That's maybe. a whole nother story. But Tom, I want to talk to you first about a story that you and I have been interested in for at least the last three years or so, and that is former D.C. delegate Walter Fontroy is apparently coming back home to Washington. For years, no one knew where he was. He was finally being identified as somewhere near Dubai. He is currently apparently in the United Arab Emirates, where he was tracked down by the U.S. Embassy, which says it will facilitate his return here. He has some legal problems to face when he comes back. He looks very thin and emaciated in the photo that I saw, but at the very least, he is coming back. Yes, finally, you know, we've covered the story for a couple of years. I've interviewed his wife, who was sitting at home in a house that was going to be foreclosed. Uh, his children worried about him. He said he was off. Lord knows what things he said he was going to do, but then he would disappear for a long time. Finally, the State Department got involved uh, and located him, and they've talked to him, and now he says he will come home. He had some pending thing left over from the first uh, uh, Obama inaugural where he put on some big party or for the Obama inaugural, and he had a bill of $55,000 and somehow that bill didn't get paid. And so he's subject to some kind of arrest because of civil suits involved in that. And, uh, but anyway, the, the good news is he'll be coming home in the next couple of weeks unless something happens. And uh, it would be good for him to be here and make sure he um, gets any mental health he needs and see his family and try to get back into town. He really ought to be here for the September uh, opening of the African American Museum because a lot of it details some of the civil rights work he did. So it would be great to have him home. Indeed, he was one of the pioneers in the civil rights movement as one of Dr. King's aides back in the 1960s. By the way, if you have questions or comments for our first guest, Corey Stewart, you can call 800-433-8850. You can go to our website, kojoshow.org, and watch the live video stream there. Send us a tweet at Kojo Show or email to kojo.wamu.org. And one other topic that Corey Stewart will probably, probably like, Tom Sherwood, and that is, what is the Clinton campaign doing to the delegation from the District of Columbia? Columbia to the Democratic National Convention. Usually the D.C. Democratic State Committee is who selects the delegates here, or most of them, but on this occasion apparently they got some instructions from the Clinton campaign that says, no, you can't simply select D.C. Council Chair Phil Mendelson or at large council member Vincent Orge. We've got some other people we want to go, and so you got to change your procedures a little people bit. People are not really happy, very active in local party politics. Let me just summarize it this way. D.C. Democrats are the most loyal Democrats in the country when it comes to presidential voting. I think it was 93 uh, percent vote for Obama in, uh, in 2008. Uh, they have now been insulted by the next nominee for uh, Clinton, Hillary Clinton's campaign. I don't think she's involved in this, but her opportunities are. The, the party on Tuesday night was to select six more delegates, five delegates and one alternate, to round out the party's delegation to Philadelphia, which is like total of 20 local people. Um, and normally they just, they vote to balance out the party in terms of workers, men and women, different, you know, nationalities to have a nice solid uh, wide group of people. Well, the Clinton campaign sent down a notice and, and, and it's her right as a candidate nominee to approve or disapprove delegates. They just sent down a list of people said, you got to select these five people from this list of 10 we gave you. And that infuriates some of the local Democrats. Now, the Democrats are not going to turn on Hillary Clinton by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, but here's what it might do. I was, uh, Phil Pinnell, who's been very active over in Ward 8, east of the river, he says, well, you know, we're going to vote for Hillary Clinton and we're Democrats. But you know what we might not do? We're so irritated. We might not send our hundreds of people, as we often do, over into Maryland or particularly Virginia, Northern Virginia, to help do groundwork campaigning for the party there. We maybe we'll just stay home. It seems like a cold, heavy handed action by the Hillary Clinton campaign. The Clinton campaign has decided that Rita Jo Lewis, who uh, was a failed district mayoral candidate, George failed with Professor, a capital F. George Sound Professor Michael Eric Dyson. Um, Cora Masters Barry and Clinton State Department Protocol Chief Capricia Marshall should be the delegates or among the delegates going from the District of Columbia. Corey Stewart, what would you advise DC Democrats to do in this situation? <laughs> you know what they ought to do? They ought to revolt and come over to the Republican Party. 
yep. and, uh, and we'll be the first to, to welcome them. And then we, we say, you know, some of these, some of these Democrats, uh, Steve Elmendorf, who's a big bundler for the Clinton administration who lives here. I mean, they're all decent uh, Democratic people. But they only have tangential um, connections to the local party, which is so disrespected by the national party, which gives them essentially lip service and eats in our restaurants and then goes back to the White House. Okay, now on to the business at hand with our guest, Corey Stewart, chairman of the Prince William Board of County Supervisors. If you have questions or comments for him, 800-433-8850. Corey Stewart is now official. Voters in the UK have elected to leave the European Union. This is something the presidential candidate you support has said is a good thing. A lot of people say the anger and frustration among British voters mirrors some of the support that Donald Trump is receiving in the United States. He landed in Scotland and immediately tweeted that the British the Brits, Brits have decided that they want their country back, which is com comparable to what he wants in the United States. How do you see it? Well, I think that's right. I think, you know, if you look at the history of uh, British and American politics, they tend to mirror each other. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the rate time of Margaret Thatcher was the time of Ronald Reagan, and it kind of went like that. And I see, I think what you're seeing in Great Britain is the same thing that you're seeing in America. Uh, which is people are sick and tired, whether they're on the left or the right, they're sick and tired of the same old, same old establishment politicians, all lip service, no problems getting solved, and uh, they're ready uh, for a big change. And I think you're going to see that in America uh, this year as well. Go ahead, Tom. You're running the... Um how did you become the chairman of the Trump campaign in Virginia? You really didn't even hadn't really known him or met him even until he came to Manassas earlier this year. Well, he knew uh, Trump was very well aware of my efforts in 2007 and 2008 uh, to crack down on illegal immigration in Prince William County. It made a lot of national news. You remember? Yes, quite a bit. And uh, he, <laughs> yeah, that's right. You were there, <laughs> and and um, so he said he really admired that. Um, you know, he wanted somebody with some guts. And uh, so that's why he, he uh, called me up and, and asked me to be his chairman. You know, some of the other leaders, of, even at the most recent Republican, Virginia Republican uh, state uh, party meeting, you know, other Republican leaders, Ken Cuccinelli, among others, were for other candidates. You had a, a fairly wide variety of choices. Uh, why did you pick Trump or, or did he just pick you? Well, I look at consider, things yeah. in a historical thing. And I think, look, the Republican Party has been in the wilderness for the last eight years outside of the White House. And it has forced the party to look inside and figure out what's going wrong. Why is it that Romney got defeated and McCain before him? We were choosing candidates, particularly with Romney, who were boring, corporatist, people that the average Joe could not relate to. And we had lost all of our popular appeal. And I saw Trump as although he's a very wealthy man, he, we call him the you know nickname, the blue collar billionaire for a reason. He speaks like a blue collar guy. He is, you know, he's very outspoken in how he, he, and he believes that the country's headed in the wrong direction. He's worried about the loss of manufacturing jobs. And that appeals to a lot of people who have never supported a Republican candidate, at least in the last 20 or 30 years, we have not been able to attract blue collar workers. He's the guy who can do it, and that's why I joined the campaign. Indeed. When you announced that you would be seeking the nomination for governor just five months after winning your third term as chairman of the Board of Supervisors in Prince William County, one of the things you said is that you're running for governor in part because you have a lot in common with Donald Trump. What did you mean by that? Well, I speak my mind. It sometimes get, gets me into trouble, uh, but ultimately people want that. Uh, I'm very tough on illegal immigration, so is he. I'm concerned about the loss of manufacturing jobs, so is he. Uh, I come from blue-collar roots. My dad was a longshoreman. I've never really, until That's now... That's a union job, isn't it? It's a union it? job. He was wow. a big International Longshoremen's Association a supporter. Uh, and I, until, until, until Trump came along, I have never felt totally comfortable in the Republican Party until now. Because it would, to me, it was just a little bit too stuffy, a little bit too corporatist, a not a lot of appeal to the common man, and uh, and it, it was, you know, now I, I feel a lot better about that, and I think that there's going to be a pre-Trump era and a post-Trump era. Uh, uh, certainly on the Republican side, and I think there's a big change coming for American politics going forward. Where, where would the, looking at the Virginia, it's commonly seen as a battleground state, Ohio, Florida, uh, some people are even saying Pennsylvania this time. 
But where are the votes? I mean, Tom Davis, a former Republican congressman from Northern Virginia, has said that Northern Virginia looks more like New Jersey than it does like the Commonwealth of Virginia in terms of the diversity of the people who moved there. Even your own county, Prince William, has a growing Latino population and the Muslim population. Where do you think the votes are to win a statewide contest for Donald Trump versus Hillary Clinton? And we don't know who the vice president. You mean in Northern Virginia? Or well, I mean Virginia just the state. I mean, where because you know three corner, the three corner offense the Democrats do. They they win in Northern Virginia, they win in Hampton Roads, and they win in Roanoke, and they win the state. Where do you guys? So win? for for Donald Trump, the votes are going to come out heavy along the eighty one corridor, uh, in the Valley, all across South Side Virginia. Southwest is going to be heavy turnout for him. Certain portions of Hampton Roads are going to be very very strong for Donald Trump. The Richmond suburbs in general are going to vote for, for Trump. Uh, then you come to Northern Virginia, and this is where the, Repu the Democrats, this has been their, this is where they've won the elections. They've had heavy turnout in, in Alexandria, Arlington, Fairfax County, and they've narrowly won uh, Loudoun and Prince William counties, the two swing right. counties. Now You're the swing part of the swing state. We really are. I mean, the Prince William and Loudoun counties, it's almost 800,000 people among us, and you know, there's suburban voters, a lot of independent-minded people, people very busy. It's tough for a kind of a, a candidate who's turning over the apple cart. He wants to change things. It's tough for Trump in Northern Virginia for that reason, because most people, a lot of people in Northern Virginia, either work for the federal government or they work for a federal contractor, and they don't necessarily want to see things overturned. I think this year might be a little bit different just because you've got so many defense contractors and employees of defense contractors, very concerned about the state of the military, and you have 800,000, think about that for a moment, 800,000 veterans in the Commonwealth of Virginia who are not going to be very happy with Hillary Clinton. What do you say to people who say, but in the primaries, Hillary Clinton got a lot more votes in Virginia, even in Prince William County, than did Donald Trump? Well, she there was a it was a two person it was a two person race on the Democratic side, and then on the Republican side, we started off with seventeen, and by that point, we still had several people in the race. So, I I wouldn't look at that for a Republican. Uh, Trump has received more votes than any other Republican in history, despite the fact that there were so many people uh, in the primary process. The the Democratic Party, as you just mentioned, has been winning all the statewide races most recently, although. Mr. Gillespie nearly beat Mark Warner. Is that right? Uh, what Mark Warner? What that was right, in that, 2014. In 2014, a very mm -hmm. close race there. But um, what what Tim Kaine has been uh, the state the senator from Virginia has been heavily mentioned as a potential vice presidential candidate with Hillary Clinton. Now he was considered by Obama too in 2008, so he kind of laughs at the idea that he might be chosen, but he's prepared to be chosen to be the vice presidential candidate. Wouldn't that just be a slam dunk for Virginia after that? Doesn't that hurt you? Look, I like Tim Kaine on a personal level. Uh, I get along with him just fine. Uh -oh. I always have, even when he was governor, etc. Uh, but he is not the kind of person who's going to light up the state. There's not a whole lot of people who just absolutely love Tim Kaine out there. Uh, he's, I think he's probably a safe candidate for, for Hillary Clinton, but he's not going to change the dynamic at all. And I don't even think he's going to change things in, in Virginia. And speaking of, you know, 2014 Republicans, we can't rely on the same, you know, people say, well, Ed Gillespie almost won in 2014, but that was the biggest Republican tied year in 20 years since 1994. We were winning in places like Maryland, Illinois, uh, Massachusetts, and we lost Virginia. So I, I don't think that you know, we can rely on that same level of support and, and uh, that same Republican wave in 2014 that we're going to face in Speaking 2016. Speaking of Ed Gillespie, that's one of the people you'll be up against in your decision to run for governor. You sought the Republican nomination for lieutenant governor in 2013, came in in third place. How do you think the political landscape in Virginia has changed since then? And how will you maneuver this new race against two other candidates, one of them, Ed Gillespie, the other one, Congressman Rob Whitman, that are closer to the moderate end than you are? Well, they certainly are. Uh, both of those candidates are very, very moderate, especially Gillespie. He that's, is, not a, that's not a positive in your mind. No, it's not. <laughs> we are in an anti-establishment era where people are tired of the same old, same old. They're tired of, of politicians like Gillespie who listen to the consultants and don't do anything without consulting their consultants. 
and they're very safe. He never takes a chance on anything. He will never take a controversial stand to support any controversial uh, conservative position. People are tired of that kind of politician. They want somebody who's going to go out there, put themselves on the line, take a courageous stand and stick with it. And by the way, get things done, which I've, I've been able to do. Can put you? on your headphones, gentlemen, because I'm about to go to the telephone to Mike in Fairfax, Virginia. Mike, you are on the air. Go ahead, please. Thanks for taking my call, Kojo. First of all, I love Tim Kaine. Uh, he's a fellow harmonica player, so that, that's a big plus to me. But, uh, Mr. Stewart, I've been boycotting your county since you uh, instituted the Show Me Your Papers law, and I, I haven't spent a single dollar in Prince William County. I make sure to fill up my car before or after I cross the county line. And I don't see how you chairing this campaign is going to help Donald Trump with a very important voting block in Virginia, which is Latino voters. If anything, it's going to torpedo it. How do you think you're going to help Donald Trump win in Virginia with its large Latino population? Let me ask the caller this question. If somebody is in the country illegally and they commit a crime and they endanger you and other American families and they've got a criminal record, should that person be deported? I think Obama has uh, deported 400,000 of them this year, all convicted of violent crime. He has only removed the, the most serious criminals, but there are a lot of people who are released who have committed domestic assault. DUIs, taking indecent liberties with children. If somebody's here illegally and they've committed one of those crimes, don't you think they should have been deported? I don't understand how your show me your papers plan of stopping people based on their ethnicity while we lying don't do that. saying that it's we not don't about do that. their ethnicity. How could you possibly say that you're not using national origin as a reason to stop somebody and suspect them of illegal immigration? Because we don't stop people based upon national origin. What happens is once somebody's been arrested for committing a crime, at that point we check everybody concerning their immigration status. We don't just stop people and ask them for their papers. Uh, back to his original question, he feels that you're not going to get a lot of Latino votes for Donald Trump or maybe even for yourself. And there's 21 percent Latino population, I think it now is the Prince William number. That's that? right. Now, you know, right at the time when I was leading this effort, this crackdown on illegal immigration, establishment politicians like Ed Gillespie and others were telling me not to pursue it because it was in a very diverse, large, multicultural community. But, you know, my my numbers actually went up. I actually increased my percentage of my victory in 2007, increased it again in 2011 and in 2015. And here's why. Because Latinos who are here legally, they don't necessarily support illegal immigration. And I got a lot of Latino support. Donald Trump's going to get a lot of Latino support. And also, I might add that the African-American population in Prince William County and across Virginia is probably more hurt by the effects of illegal immigration than any other demographic in the state. And you're going to find that the illegal immigration issue is going to find a lot of support, not just among Caucasians, but among all races, because people know that if you're here illegally and you've committed a crime and you pose a public safety threat, you should be removed. And that's what we've been doing in Prince William County. That's what I want to do in Virginia. And you think they're taking jobs, the immigrants are taking jobs that other Americans could actually have. I think that's absolutely true. I mean, this whole standard line that that. Uh, illegal immigrants are only taking those jobs that Americans don't have. Look, it's pushing down the wages of blue collar workers in Virginia and across the country. They've been stagnant for 20 years, right at the same time that we've had massive amounts of illegal immigration into the United States. You've disagreed with uh, Donald Trump on the Muslim ban. I was, I was reading, correct me if the media was wrong, but I did read this, that you disagree with, with Donald Trump's idea of the temporary Muslim ban. I do disagree with them on that. I've got a lot of support uh, among uh, Muslims uh, in Prince William County. They're some of our most. You said you hope to be a bridge between Trump and the Muslim and I, community. And I, and I hope to do that. And in fact, I've been making moves in that, uh, in that direction. Uh, the, the Muslim community in Prince William County is very law-abiding. They're some of our most productive, educated, hardworking citizens. And I just don't. So look, I don't agree with everything. But that's okay. Because with Trump, at least you know where he stands, and you can't really start a dialogue with somebody and, and work to create a bridge unless somebody's willing to speak directly and honestly with you. Kathy Saliga, who is the uh, Saliga, who is the Republican candidate for Senate in Maryland, has in fact criticized Donald Trump for his remarks about the judge of the Mexican uh, heritage, and saying that she believed that was a racist comment. Uh, where did you have you 
commented on his his talk about the judge in his case? Well, I think that, look, at the end of the day, everybody knows where Donald Trump is on illegal immigration. And he was very concerned that this judge, who had been very active in the CASA, the, the, the uh, a branch of CASA, um, which is very active on illegal immigration issues, uh, that he was not going to get a fair uh you know, hearing on this issue. And so you can understand, I can understand where he's coming from on that. Oh, do you, you, can, go ahead. I got a zillion questions here. Oh, well, no, I'm not. <laughs> no, no, but I'm, I'm going to be in Cleveland for the Channel 4 on the Republican convention. You're going to be there for the, with uh, support. How do you, it, a lot of people are saying this is going to be wild. There are going to be demonstrations in the street like Chicago, which I, some people say will help Trump and his image. What are you expecting in, in, um, uh, in terms of a vice presidential candidate, do you have a pick in mind that you would suggest? What do you expect out of the convention? Well, I think that to the extent that there's any disunity out there, and there is some, I think a lot there will be unity after the convention. Uh, I don't think that these, uh, you know, these threats of changing the rules and taking the nomination, that's just not going to happen. It's just, that's just not going to happen. The, um, I don't know who's going to be picked for VP. You don't have a choice. I, I well, I, I would. I'm. I'm I kind of like Newt Gingrich to tell you the truth. I think he knows how to get things done. He's been in Congress for a long time. He was Speaker of the House, and uh, Trump is going to. Trump is an outsider. He's going to br bring that fresh business-like approach to government, which probably means he's going to need somebody inside the legislature, inside Congress, uh, to help him out. Because you have to have somebody that the evangelicals will will rally around. I don't. Well, it's surprisingly, New, New, I, my, I, my I, yeah. name doesn't come to mind when I think of evangelicals who are going to be excited. Well, I, I think that Trump already is attracting a lot of the evangelical vote, even during the primary when there were more evangelical politicians, uh, you know, in the in the process. Trump was still getting a good share of the evangelicals because they're not looking for another evangelical. They're just looking for someone who's going to protect them against um, and protect the religious freedoms. But here's your task. How do you plan on bringing together Virginia conservatives, those who are still split over their support for Donald Trump? So I've been traveling all over the state. I got uh, two stops tonight. I got another, I got a couple more tomorrow at night. Um, and I'm hearing less and less of this so-called never, never Trump movement. You know, if nothing else, uh, conservatives look at the Supreme Court and they think over the next uh, four years, the next president of the United States is, is likely to appoint what? Three, Three, possibly four new Supreme Court justices. If, if, if Hillary Clinton is elected, that is a total transformation of the Supreme Court. It's going to result in another activist court like we had in the 1970s, and that alone is enough to, to unify conservatives. And it's likely the Senate may switch to a Democratic hands, and that would make it even tougher for, for the very scenario you just described. The, the if liberal, she wins the presidency, would, they could possibly win it, the Senate too. It would be a disaster for the country and a disaster uh, mm -hmm. for um, – for the Republican We Party. got a tweet from Luke Warncott who says, um, what do you feel is at stake for Virginia in the Brexit? Because UK is Virginia's fourth largest export market. Well, I think it's too early to say. Yeah, I think that it's too hard to say. And, and, and honestly, uh, you know, I, I, this is not going to be a, a just the destruction of Great Britain. Uh, this is obviously going to cause some internal problems inside of the EU. With And there could be others after this. It might just, just end with Britain. There could be others. Uh, and also the Virginia ports, are, are there's a big expansion of the ports down there to handle more traffic from the Panama Canal. I mean, there's a lot going on in terms of jobs in, the, in Virginia, for, depending on what the national policies are. Well, that's right. You know, the Port of Virginia is, you know, accounts for uh, a lot of her jobs in the, not just in the port area, but, uh, you know, the coal industry, et cetera. There's a lot of uh, material and, and uh, uh, exports come from other parts of Virginia and, and, and uh, jobs that are reliant upon the Port of Virginia. Got, Here I, now is Mark in Manassas, Virginia. Mark, you're on the air. Go ahead, please. Hello. Hi. Hi, Mark. Thanks for uh, taking my call, Kojo. Um, I'd like to keep uh, it. It seems the discussion is uh, going more statewide and even national. I'd like to keep it local here. I've been a resident of Prince William County for 35, 40 years and seen the growth here. Um, you know, we, we have a population in the county of uh, roughly 450,000 people, which is uh, larger than uh, a lot of cities. Yet we still 
I feel we still function as a uh, small rural county uh, as far as our services, uh, especially in, when it comes to uh, taking care of our older neighborhoods, which we have quite a few um, where there's affordable housing. Uh, but you know, it's it's a quality of life issue where we've got uh, uh, not you know no enforcement of the uh, housing capacity um, codes. And what's your specific question for Corey Stewart? Well, I'd like to know uh, what we're doing to bring us into the uh, 21st century as far as uh, county services and uh, and realizing that uh, we're we're a larger county than what we're acting like. Okay. Growing well, pains. What are you yeah. doing on your day job, Corey? <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Mark. Thanks for that question. And uh, I'm glad you're in Prince William County. Look, um, we are, uh, there's a balance. Uh, you know, if you, if you want a lot of county services, if you, if you want a Fairfax County, you're going to pay for it. Uh, so our tax bills in Prince William County are 30% lower than they are in Fairfax County, uh, 35% below uh, the, the region. So our tax burden is a lot less. That does mean that our services are a little bit more sparse. That said, we've got great schools. Uh, we've got the most robust road building, road construction program in the state. We, we've just invested another fifty uh, million dollars in our park system, and we're keeping up. But it is county police Mark, and and county police. We're, continu we're continuing to add. We have over six hundred and fifty officers. In fact, there was a graduation earlier today, uh, and we're going to continue to do that. But that said, when we're growing by 10,000 new residents a year, and we are, Mark is right, we're at 450,000. We're about to su surpass Virginia Beach in, to in, to in terms of uh, and become the second largest locality in Virginia. These things are hard to keep up with, but we are investing very quickly. Uh, we have school issues, but we're, we're building about two to three new schools per year, uh, hiring hundreds of new teachers a year. And we're catching up with things, but it just takes some time. It's, can we get I'm uh, running out of time? Okay, go very quickly on money. The Trump uh, go back to national politics. Uh, this uh, this is a softball, maybe. All right, the media has made a great deal about the fact that, that Trump has not put up a lot of money and has not raised a lot of money and has barely a Senate campaign or a House campaign of money. What is the media missing? about where Trump stands now going into the general election. Yeah, so what the media is missing on this is that you gotta remember that Trump didn't start fundraising until after he secured the nomination. Uh, and so of course, May's numbers were dismal because the, the fundraising uh, operation was in its uh, infancy. June is going to look a whole lot better. And the other thing is we combined the Trump campaign operation with the RNC operation. Uh, we're gonna have shortly, we're gonna have around 60 paid staff in Virginia alone and uh, it's going to be, it's becoming more and more robust. And there was this coordination that has to happen between the RNC and the Trump campaign, which I'm pretty much in charge of at this point, but it is occurring. Demand for action on gun control heightened this week. Chairman of the board of county supervisors, you've tried to eliminate the fee for concealed handgun permits. What is the support within Prince William County that you've received for this? And when mass shootings happen and gun control becomes a hot button issue, how do you think we should be framing this conversation regionally and in Virginia? It's not well, going to go away. I did lead Prince William County in eliminating the concealed carry permit, the first locality in Virginia to eliminate the fee, except for the $15, which is mandated by the state. Now, I don't see the um, uh, the the problems down, you know, the 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 mass shooting in Orlando and other is a gun control issue. Uh, I think that at the end of the day, there's just no way that you're going to be able to keep weapons out of the hands of terrorists or criminals. They're going to be able to get them. They got them in, 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 um, in the mass shootings in, in Paris, uh, where they got some of the toughest gun control laws in, in, in the world. So, um, I, I, I think that the the gun, you know, trying to use gun control as a solution to a terrorist attack is absolutely absurd. The, there was a poll, uh, uh, Last public, question. public policy a, a polling that said that something like 88 percent of the people in the state support background checks on all gun sales. Is that something you support? And I think 55 percent support assault weapon bans. And then, but what about that? Just in general, if you're going to buy a gun, you, you have to have a background check right. no matter where you get that. Well, I mean, for the most part, you do have to get a background check in, in Virginia, though there, there are some exceptions to that. But, um, you know, 
there's a bigger problem with lack of enforcement of the existing laws of keeping guns out of the control, uh, out of the hands of, of, of violent felons uh, and people with, you know, who are, have been certified as mentally uh, unable to, to, to possess a handgun or a weapon. And I think it's more important that we enforce the law rather than create new ones. Corey Stort, he's the chairman of the Prince William Board of County Supervisors. He's a Republican, also chairman of the Donald Trump campaign for president in Virginia. He's announced plans to run for governor of Virginia next year. Corey, thank you for joining us. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. See you in Cleveland. Thank you. Tom Sherwood, he's our resident analyst. He's a reporter for NBC4 and a columnist for the current newspapers. Coming up, Nancy Florian, president of the Montgomery County Council. But first, Tom Sherwood, the District of Columbia not only moved on its $15 an hour minimum wage, giving final approval to that bill, a council committee also uh, advanced a controversial bill, according to the Washington Post, that would strict set strict guidelines for telling employers in the city how much advance notice they must give their employees when scheduling their shifts. This practice known as just-in-time scheduling, where often people only find out what their new schedules are going to be with less than 24 hours notice, has been controversial around the country, and the district now becomes the second jurisdiction in the country, the other, I think, being San Francisco, to decide that employers who have shops, so to speak, or operations in more than 50 locations can't keep doing that. Yeah, it's not going to be affecting Montgomery County. Our next guest may want to weigh on this, but you know, there are people who, who are in such need of jobs that they'll have jobs where, where they essentially wait by their uh, cell phone uh, to get a call saying, yes, you'll come to work today. No, you won't come today. It's like being called a jury duty where you call up every day, see if you are wanted to the next day. And so that's, but this is part of a, a series of bills that are being passed through the district government, uh, whether it's the $15 minimum wage, whether it's sick leave or vacation leave for part-time employees, uh, all of these things are building up in, in in the city to make it to address the the, um, the income gap and the difficulty people have of raising families in the current economic environment. So I'm not surprised the council has done this. I think you'll see more. The big hoon in all of this is paid family leave, which is kind of star snarled and stuck with council chairman Phil Mendelson till a bit later this year. He had said he wanted to vote on this before the council recessed this summer. Uh, I don't know if he's going to meet that deadline or not. Employers are already ramping up their opposition to it. As I said, joining us in studio is Nancy Florian, president of the Montgomery County Council. She's a Democrat who holds an at-large seat. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, Kojo. If you have questions or comment for the president of the council, call us at 800-433-8850. Send email to kojo at wamu.org. Watch the conversation. Our live video stream is at our website, kojoshow.org. You can send us a tweet. At Kojo Show, you've gotten a lot of attention in the county lately trying to do something about collective bargaining and unions, but some people, generally union leaders, says these are a series of solutions to problems that do not exist. Mm -hmm. What are you trying to accomplish by proposing the bill, and what are the specific solutions you're offering? Well, uh, what we have, uh, well, first of all, uh, the bill I've introduced on uh, collective bargaining uh, largely reflects the recommendations of an organizational reform commission uh, that set these uh, proposals out about five years ago. And I will tell you, over the years, we've heard nothing, uh, backdoor complaints from the county executive team on how the existing rules really hamper uh, their ability to come to what they find and really Back believe to be an equitable complaints. solution. That's right. Uh, and, you know, at a certain point, you need to rebalance the, the field, and that's what this bill does. What's the, the number, uh, I've forgotten the numbers, it's something like out of a X number of arbitrations that have, have gone up on... 16 you know. of 20 have <laughs> been won by the county right. union. And so, and it's your plan, and I'll, I'll listen to your, the video you put out about what's on the agenda, I think you did it Monday for Tuesday. Mm -hmm. um, this, you would replace this arbitration thing where the, you just the county has to follow whatever the arbitrator decides uh, with a three-person committee, a one-person representing labor, one person representing government, I guess, and then a neutral person? That's right. Well, the way it works now is it's a combined mediation arbitration person the who same handles person. the process. The same person. So what's the point of uh, if you lose – if you're – the, it has really 
forced the, the whole process to be congealed into that one event, the mediation process. Because you're appealing, if you want to appeal some element of the uh, agreement, you are appealing to the person who participated in it. So there's, you know, no independent And you want review. the county to hire a, a labor uh, what's the title? Well, there are a couple, a couple of individuals who a labor uh, play, relations administrator. play 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 a for, uh, a role in all of that. The labor relations administrator is basically the empire. Uh, it's sort of uh, fashioned after the labor national labor relations rules, as I understand it. And basically, that's the person you appeal to about how how the negotiation is occurring. And the way it works now is basically that person is is selected only from a list that has been approved by the unions. So, so there's no really independent so, uh, ro role for uh, uh, the, the county to play in that. And frankly, you know, at the end of the day, this is a public official recommended by the county executive and confirmed by the county council. And actually in D.C., uh, they have um, an independent uh, review person like we would achieve you, here. You in said that when you made this announcement, you were going to introduce the bill. Have you have co-sponsors? Uh, yes, one of my colleagues, uh, Craig Rice, is on the bill. Okay, and you said you would meet, and, and of course, yeah. the unions, uh, the workers, the county workers, where they were union, I, the county workers did feel the auditorium uh, or the council chamber when you made this announcement about putting this bill forward. I noticed you did welcome them that day. But, of course. But yeah. uh, you said also that you would meet with some of the union people, mm -hmm. the leaders. Have you had those meetings yet? Uh, we're scheduling them now. Scheduling them now. Yeah. So uh, they, you know, we'll, we'll certainly get to When did you expect to a vote on this bill? Oh, I don't know. Sometime in the fall. Sometime in the fall. Um, just one clarification here, because your bill would give the exclusive right to choose the labor relations administrator to the combination of the executive and the council. The executive That's right. would choose the um, that leaves the union completely out of that equation, so to speak. Well, they get to lobby. And, they do uh, and a good believe job of me, uh, we get lobbied, uh, and so does the county executive. So that you know, this is not some some wacky idea. And as I said, that's how they do it here in the district. During the recession, the council deferred pay increases and promised that workers would be made whole when times improved. When times improved. The council then trimmed the promise rages, wage, raises. Why are you, it seems, reneging on those promises? Well, we never promised anything. The county executive did. Apparently. <laughs> uh, there is always, uh, you know, it depends on who you speak to in this regard. But you Look, our, our employees were uh, poised to get an 8% raise. Let me ask you guys, what kind of raise did you get this year? 8%? I have no idea. Well, there you go. <laughs> well, we're, let me just make uh, a distinction. So people, we're in the private sector, <laughs> so we don't have to say. Well, there you go. But we, <laughs> everything we say is out there above board, and you can check our facts however you want to. Uh, but, it, you know, the whole point of uh, what we did in this budget, really, was to bring some fiscal reality to the situation. And I will tell you, the people at the Washington Post just laughed at what we considered a big success. The uh, post meaning the editorial pages? Yeah, okay. I know. Well, the UFCW Local 1994 uh, says your plan will gut collective bargaining and well, it will help. It will, the union wants binding arbitration to stay because they, they don't have any power except negotiation. Well, of course, and this doesn't eliminate any of that. You know, look, their job is to stamp their feet. The job is what? The, to, the stamp unions, their feet. to stamp their feet. But when you. No, that's okay. When the county executive made a promise, the council reneged on the promise. In response, public employee unions agreed to defer but not cancel their pay increases, which are worth about $2 million. Why is the council canceling the pay increases rather than deferring them? As I said, we didn't make any promise, number one. And number two, you know, we are the ones who write the checks. And we're the ones who have to raise the taxes. Not, in, not the county executive. We're the ones who do all that. And we take that job really seriously. And as I said, so we're supposed to say to our people who are paying the bill uh, that our employees are getting an 8% uh, increase in compensation? Well, you're, you're, we, that was, you're, uh, that's you're out of line with the reality we know, we've heard about out there. What I'm getting from this conversation is that the council executive makes an, makes an agreement, and then there's this back door, as you characterize it, conversation, in which he says to you, the council, my hands are tied. Help me out here. 
Well, that didn't occur this year, but oh. we've heard it from previous years. All right, well, let's go ahead. I was going to say, you've got your, um, the county is having growing, urban growing pains. You've got school increases. You've got, you know, the teachers union is pretty strong too, but you've got, uh, you've, you've raised property taxes, what, 8.7%? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, is it the, your feeling that the county can afford the kind of uh, wage increases that arbitrators are giving, or you just don't want to give them? What is the issue? Well, this year we were asked when uh, Mr. Leggett sent his budget over, we were asked to uh, raise uh, property taxes to the uh, level that we f ultimately did. Uh, but that was largely, and I will say largely, uh, to go for compensation increases, both on the uh, county employee side and particularly in the school system side. And, and we said, so we're going to ask everyone to pay more, and what do they get for it? They get the same people who are better paid. So we, you know, we really made history with this budget. We did, we, we did tone back the uh, county compensation increases. Let me point out, they're still getting four and a half percent. That's okay. pretty good. What's a percent? Four and a half percent. In a, well, a Amy, one year increase or over a period of time? This year. Well, okay. put on your headphones, please, because Amy in Gaithersburg, Maryland, um, would like to disagree. Amy, you're on the air. Go ahead, please. Uh, thank you. I, I'm with uh, UFCW Local 1994, and I was a part of the contract negotiations. And I want to make a clarification to the information that uh, Ms. Lorraine is putting out in terms of raises. Um, Leggett, the, the raises that were agreed to uh, by the county executive actually held total compensation for county employees to 2% only a 2% increase in this budget year. Um, you know, while certain council members want to put out the number of 8% proposed raises, four and a half, there were certain employees who had missed steps in the past in their salary schedule. Um, and they were steps that have been deferred and given back to the county for years that would have made up their steps. And that isn't everyone. The total compensation package only went up uh, for all of the unions in uh, Leggett's budget two percent less so that's that's the first point um, oh you have a second point <laughs> <laughs> i do, well, please, I do. Make it, um, please make it as brief as briefly as possible will do um you know this this proposed legislation again it's, it's out of the alec playbook came out of of left field um we have a collective bargaining process that the council already can uh, approve or not approve the budgets that uh, that come over and the agreements with the um, with the unions. It served Montgomery County well for thirty. Plus but you years keep winning the arbitration union. decision, sixteen of twenty. Well, if if there's a particular defendant that goes to court over and over and sees different judges, uh, is the problem that the system is corrupt or perhaps the person isn't correct? Um, you know, and just to put a finer point on it, most of our uh, that's. 16 out of decades. We've had a couple of decades of labor experience. It's not a lot. And most of the arbitrations are actually over very, very narrow 16 issues. of 20. Allow me to have Nancy Florian respond. You know, our employees have received increases of about 21% in compensation over the past three years. That's pretty good. And, you know, at the end of the day, we're looking at a budget that of which 80% is compensation. Uh, if we're going to continue to to serve our residents with with good services, uh, with responsible schools, and and with the kind of community that people want to see, we can't keep increasing uh, compensation at such large. Well, rates. we got a tweet from Marty who says, "Please ask Nancy Florian how much of a raise the council voted for themselves." We didn't vote for anything for us ourselves this year. No, uh, what about we, last year? We, <laughs> what, Which what, the last what, raise? Well, the what, what they're referring to is an increase that was recommended a couple of years ago to the prior council. I was on it uh, to increase our wages pretty significantly to to really to encourage uh, uh, so, different kinds of So what was that number? I don't council. know what that number was. Uh, it it was to go to 125, it was a leap from about 100,000 to 125,000 in one okay. year. Uh, we said, whoa, that's a lot a few years ago. We had to do it by legislation. Um, and we are not allowed to increase our salaries ourselves okay. when we're in office. So we did agree to increase the uh, salaries, but we did it incrementally over time. But we can't 
uh, vote annually to adjust her salaries. I just I want to go back to something you said a little bit earlier when I asked about the union response and the people who showed up at the auditorium. You said their job is to stamp their feet. That doesn't sound like a co collaborative, collegial, cooperative way to approach unions. Well, their job okay. is to stamp their feet. <laughs> These are the people who call us clowns. So, you know, clowns have big feet. Well, <laughs> usually, <laughs> uh, you know, I uh, look, uh, I, our, our employees are terrific people and they work incredibly hard to deliver great services to Montgomery County. They're going through a tough time. That's really true. Um, they've seen a change in their compensation expectations and now they have this to deal with which, as I said, I believe levels the playing field and is not out of some right-wing group. It is was recommended to us by our people several years ago. But, you know, change is tough. And I, I hope the conversation will continue on a, on a more thoughtful level. Do, do we have time for a question unrelated to this? Sure. Quicken Loans, the golf tournament. How's that affecting the county? Is, oh, I, I couldn't tell you. I think it's going on right now. It is. That's why I thought maybe. Okay. I, I, I'm busy working on public policy. Then we, have time, we have time for Chris in Silver Spring, Maryland. Chris, you're on the air. Go ahead, please. Yeah, thank you, Kojo. Good afternoon, Council Member uh, Florine. Hey. I'd, I'd like to ask you how you uh, are standing on a bill to protect renters' rights uh, in Montgomery County. It's specifically Bill 19 15. It's been uh, in the hopper, your committee, for a year. And I'm curious if it's going to get passed this session. What would the bill provide? The bill would provide uh, increased inspection uh, of uh, 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 land uh, of apartment buildings that are uh, in some cases infested with uh, mold, vermin, and uh, substandard building. Uh, in particular, there are um, stories of uh, apartment buildings that uh, have gone uh, for three for five years with uh, over a hundred violations each year. Uh, and I'm curious about whether or not she'll support a bill that would increase the number of inspectors. Uh, and uh, uh, otherwise assist uh, 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 tenants in uh, being able to predict the amount that they're going to be paying for their housing from year to year. Mm -hmm. Nancy Florian. Uh, well, uh, that's a good question. We're going to take it up again on Monday. You may know we're going to have a work session. Actually, the sponsor of that bill uh, asked uh, us to delay it. Uh, since Who is the sponsor? Uh, this is Mark Elridge. Uh, he asked us to delay it once he got the fiscal impact of the bill, which was uh, significant. Uh, we've had we're able to he asked us to restart it we've had a work session during the budget and now we're returning to that uh we shall see how that sorts out um uh we'll hear from the director of housing and uh, uh community affairs on monday about how inspections uh are going now what improvements he can make already this is uh, these are legitimate issues and we're really worried about them we have uh, ha have a lot of concerns about making sure that our housing is safe and uh, certainly affordable to our residents. This is Real truly, challenge this is a truly the urbanization of the suburban counties. You're, these issues are occurring in Prince George's and all of the suburban counties. It's a real challenge. You know, our population growth ha is is significant. You heard about that even out in the outskirts of, uh, of the Washington region with your prior guest. Uh, we have a, a growth in population. And let's agree, everyone wants to be near the center of the free world. That isn't going to go away. And how do we deal with that? That's always in, our challenge. West Bard, for example. You, you, supported, <laughs> you, supported, you supported the West Bard. Uh, you know, I was wondering if that was going to come up. Of course it's going to come up. <laughs> yeah. All the rich people live around West Bard. Well, you know, it was a community that hasn't really been involved in the land use and planning process for many years. It was really hard for them uh, to come come to see the planning process, to see the prospect of some change. If uh, you've been over to the West Bard area, you know, they have a pretty crummy uh, shopping center where that giant is. And the whole question is, how do you revital, get improvements made, uh, achieve some modicum of affordable housing, which does not exist in that portion of Montgomery County, oh, at the same time, left. create a compatible community relationship with all of that. Compatible or combatible? Well, <laughs> that, that, combatible. That, that should probably, it will probably I think you meant compatible, but okay, I got In the it. 40 seconds we have left, the Center for Public Education recommends class sizes of 15 to 18 students for increasing student achievement. Your county's goal is to reduce class sizes by two students. Why project pushing for such a dramatic release in class size? Well, you know, uh, we all believe that certainly young children in particular need attention. 
There's no question about that. The question is, how can we afford it? And Correct. where do we put those kids? Uh, and so it's always a combination of operating money, capital money, and a, a changing population. It, it's been a, a real challenge since I've lived in Montgomery County, and I suspect it's going to continue throughout the region. Nancy Florian, she's president of the Montgomery County Council. She's a Democrat who holds an at-large seat. Thank you for joining us. My pleasure. It's been great. That's it for the show today, but the conversation doesn't end here. Yesterday, a federal court judge issued a ruling that will allow transgender Virginia student Gavin Grimm to use the boys' restroom at his school while his court case proceeds. Producer Avery Kleinman spoke with Gavin as the case was unfolding. You can find that conversation at kojoshow.org slash blog. Wherever your travels take you over the weekend, remember you can take the show with you on the go via your favorite podcast app or streaming service. However you listen, be sure to meet us back here Monday at noon local responses to a global health scare. We'll find out how communities in our region are responding to the Zika threat and what residents should know about the resources available to them. That's all coming up Monday at noon. Tom Sherwood, before we go, what happened to Tommy Wells' bicycle former council? Uh, his, his, what is it, Brumpton, or whatever that word is? It's a, uh, it's a very expensive bike, $1,700. He was at the Council of Governments on North Capitol Street at 8th Street. He, he uh, Somebody stole it. Thank you all for listening. I'm Kojo Nandi. <laughs>